Let's talk to God. Holy God, our Father, righteous judge, creator, sustainer, comforter. We're here before you this morning to learn more about you, to become closer to you, to trust you, and to be lights and representatives of the kingdom that you are building for eternity. God, I thank you for partnering, bringing us into partnership for the future that you have for us. I just ask that you bless this message, that it touch where it needs to touch, that it go where it needs to go. We know that your word does not return into you void. We trust that. Lord, give us the faith to do whatever it is you have prepared, all those good works. In Jesus' name, amen. So believe it or not, we're going to begin with a video. <laughs> so what if after going through all of that tragedy, stepping up to take care of their nieces and nephews, making them a part of their immediate family, and being blessed with a beautiful new home, with a barn. What if God asked the Hamptons to pack up everything and leave? Well, let me tell you about a family that that did actually happen to. There was a man named Terry who had three sons and one of his sons, Harry, died right there in front of him. Harry's untimely death left his children with no dad. So Terry and his other two sons, Abe's, Abe and Ben, stood in the gap. They brought the children into their households and started a new life. They moved to a new home, and things were pretty good. Things were really good for Abe. His wife was a babe. Business was good. He had lots of wealth and many employees, and he had a pretty good relationship with his nephew, who he continued to care for after his father, Terry, grew old and passed away himself. And then one day out of nowhere, God showed up and told him to leave his home. So let's read the full version. This will be in Genesis 11. We'll be reading verses 27 through 29 and verses 31 through 32. And it says, now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Ezkah. Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, and his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So there are some interesting tidbits in this story. And I'm sure it's easy enough to see how I gave Terah and Haran and Abram more modern nicknames, Terry, Harry, and Abe. You may be wondering how I came up with Ben. For Nahor. But as it turns out, Nahor, which means freeman, has a related version, uh, a related name version in Hebrew, Ben-Hur, or son of a freeman. So that's how we got Ben. There's another more significant mystery in this passage that has had scholars stuck in really long dialogues uh, for apparently centuries, right? And that is whether or not Iska is actually Sarai, which could mean that both Ben and Abe married their cousins when their uncle Harry died, right? And Lot stayed with his grandpa, Terry. Of course, this takes us down the rabbit hole 
of later in the story when Abram tells the king of Egypt and another king that his beautiful wife was actually his sister or maybe his half-sister. But since he was already lying about that, we don't know if he just decided to tell like a better lie or if he could, uh, so that he could scoot out of there with his life and his wife, right? Um, and then there is the idea of whether or not Terry's sons were literally all three born when he was 70 or if that's just when he started and if they were or if they were all born at the same time, are they triplets or do they have different moms? And where are these moms or where is the mom in the story? <laughs> and is it, it's so it's, it's really actually worth a Google search just to entertain yourself with the different viewpoints when you ask any of these questions. But getting back to the story, after going through losing an uncle, taking care of his cousins, and trying to make peace with being childless, moving to a new place and starting over, God told Abram to make his family surrender their comfort without a full picture of how that was all gonna actually work out. So in Genesis 12, we're reading verses one through five, and it says, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went and as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. So, Abram, or Abe, as I like to call him, the father of faith, was just as quick to leave his situation at God's instruction when it was good as he had been when things were really bad. And I'm telling y'all, I'm not sure I'm that good. Sometimes I look around me and the, at the life that I love and I pray that, that God doesn't ask me to give that up. Not my home, not my work, not my family. But Abe did all three, no question. What about you? What crises have you endured? Are things fairly settled now? Are you comfortable? I know as a denomination, we went through some pretty cosmic changes that resulted in, if we tell the truth about it, catastrophic losses. I remember when I was a kid and Sacramento had an AM service and a PM service and there was hundreds of people in both. Here we are. But that seems like a lifetime ago, right? And we're pretty comfortable now. But what if God asks you to give that up? In my own history, God has delivered me from some pretty earth-shattering situations. Abusive relationships, loss of loved ones that left me desperately heartbroken, the fight of my life to have every single one of my children physically and through court systems that were willing to make assumptions about me, losing my home, losing my income, health crises. And I tell you what, it was so easy to have faith in those dark times. Anything you want me to do, Lord, I will do it. And a good, loving living God brought me through and out of every one of those situations and has given me in its place a better life than I could have ever dreamed. I love my family traditions. I love my life. I love my work. But what would my answer be if God said, all right, Kairos, give all that up now and do something different for me? Lord, what is it? <laughs> that would be pretty scary. 
I have a, a new friend on social media. She's a woman pastor with an unassuming ministry on Facebook. Her name is Shun Dennis Strickland. And in one of her posts, she speaks to this very thing. She says, the enemy attempts to use fear to get us to reject God's will for our lives. He wants us to see ourselves as incapable of doing what God said so that our disobedience to God seems rational. And then she gave some, some ways to move beyond that fear. One, she says, study and meditate on God's word for your life. Two, agree with God quickly. He knows you better than you do. Three, do what God says, period. And four, surround yourself with others who are committed to fulfilling their God-given destinies. But if I tell the truth to myself, about myself, I have given the enemy some additional tools to use against me. You want to know what barriers there are to my faith in good times? Ego, self-centeredness, being comfortable, my preferences, laziness. Now I do know that some of y'all know my schedule. And I typically, I am typically on the move for about 19 out of 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So you may wonder how laziness factors in. And it's because it's easier to keep doing what I'm doing. Being a slave to my own will and blaming the calendar than it would be to make it stop. To stop, to create a new process, to learn the new process, to embrace it, and to give it the same amount of effort and energy that I give to the things that I want to do. You know what I learned from Abraham? Life is bigger and better with obedience to God, no matter how good it was before he asked. Living out our faith requires courage and surrender and sacrifice. Sometimes it can mean feeling less secure. I took a pretty significant pay cut leaving retail management in the Bay Area to move to Sacramento and work in the nonprofit sector with no benefits. Can you imagine if I was still doing Christmas displays instead of birth work? The Apostle Paul went from the pulpit to the prison floor, from the synagogue to the center flogged. And God may very well take away the solution that he gave for your last problem in order to give you an assignment. Sometimes we believe that the new, sometimes what we, what we believe is the new norm is actually really just a training ground. Think about Moses. After the crisis in Egypt, when there was his whole life as a prince was just blown to bits and God led him to Midian where he found community he exchanged a, a multiple deity theoc theocratic idolatry kind of religion out of Egypt down to two, right? Baal and, and Yahweh, um, served by Jethro's priesthood, his father-in-law. He gained a wife, he gained a family, and a new livelihood herding sheep. And he'd been there for 40 years when God disrupted the solution to his last problem. He went from sheep he was herding to sheep that were herding. The life he had settled in was a reprieve, but it wasn't permanent. Maybe Jesus moves people who would destroy your legacy. You lose people, even if you're close to them. That's what happened with Abram and Lot. Without his own heir, and this is another one of those rabbit hole debates in theological circles that you can chase and, and entertain yourself. But all of those numerous possessions that Abraham might have been inherited by like Lot instead or his servant or somebody. So I just want to take a look at how God handled that in Genesis 13. We're going to read verses 2 
verses 5 through 11 and verses 14 through 17. It says, Now Abraham was very rich in livestock and silver and gold. I have two horses. I'm waiting on my silver and gold. I got the livestock covered. Verse 5, And Lot said, And Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. Then in verse 8, Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me. We're family. Not between your herdsmen and my herdsmen. And we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the, the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. In verse 10, and Lot looked, lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, etc. Verse 11, so Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. In verse 14, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring can also be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So God didn't reveal the full scope of Abraham's inheritance until after Lot left. Lot, who had already shown that he was willing to take the best from his uncle and keep it for his own behalf. And humanly speaking, Lot knew that his uncle was too old to have a kid, let alone dust many kids. So, the title of my sermon is expanded notation. Remember that in math class? I was a math geek in high school and numbers still make me very happy even now. But in honor of that, I want to spring a math test on you. Ready? I'm gonna ask for a number to be brought up on the screen So I'm telling you off top, there's no special meaning for these digits. It's just a random number that I chose. 387. And it's easy to see a number, just a number, when there's no obvious connection to something that we find meaningful and just kind of dismiss its value. It's just a number. But not when you write it out in expanded notation, right? So if you have a pencil, a paper, or a phone, or whatever that is, go ahead and write it out in expanded notation. I'll give you a hint. I don't mean for you to confuse it with expanded form. Just expanded notation. I see one person with a pencil. You know, if you don't keep pencils on yourself, you won't be allowed in heaven, right? I read that somewhere. <laughs> you got it? All right. Let's, let's, let's check your work. Can we bring up the next slide? There we go. Right? Is that the answer you got? Sure. No? That's not what you got? All right. I blame public schools. But <laughs> that's the answer. So now I'm going to ask you a question. Can we bring the first number back up? Are we going to leave it? Here's my question. How many ones are there? I hear a lot of different answers, but I did hear the correct answer. 387. 
that's how many ones there are in 387. Because each one of whatever is being counted has full value of its own. And the only way to have this total is when they're all gathered together. Just like us. The full value of what God is doing is greater with your participation. His eternity grows with each person you encourage to have a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And that might mean being willing to let go of what's familiar, of what we thought was how things will be from here on out, of what we like, of what we chose, of what we invested in, of what we built. Are you willing? I'm a little less judgmental now of Lot's wife when I think about how much I like my neighborhood. Remember, she looked back and she turned into a pillar of salt. I like my neighborhood. My horses are just like 15 minutes away. And my home is my favorite place in the whole world. I understand looking back. And I do pray that God won't require my comforts of me in service to him. But more, I pray that if he asks me to, that I would with no hesitation. It's Women's History Month. There's another woman in Christian ministry named C Cindy McMenamine. And she writes for an online publication called The Crosswalk. And I came across an article that she wrote tackling the question of why God would ask us to do hard things. And she made a lot of good points. Pulling directly from an article that she wrote in 2016, she says, our sorrows and suffering help us relate to the sufferings of Jesus. Hard things deepen our relationship with the living God. Like fasting. Fasting is a hard thing. She continues to say he wants to do through us what is beyond us. And she goes on to quote Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 through 10. And here Paul says, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. When I am weak, then I am strong. But the one thing she said that resonated with me the most is her explanation of, of this saying, and maybe you've heard it. It said, God's aim is not to make us happy, it's but to make us holy. She simply laid out the fact that our God is more concerned about our eternal state than our temporary happiness. And that's what this Easter season is about. Out of all the people who have been asked to step out of good situations to do ministry, Christ gave up the most. Heaven is a pretty amazing place if I understand what my Bible is telling me. And Jesus was never going to get to keep that comfort after he committed to the Father and to the Holy Spirit for their plan of salvation. He had to break his eternity with a temporary death by breaking his body, and he did it for us. And guess what? He didn't hesitate. He didn't count the people who might not accept the gift. He bet on those who do, those who are counting on him. He counted on them. So God is good at math. He's great at investments. He literally put in blood, sweat, and tears in the garden, right, before he climbed onto that cross for our sakes. It was a calculated risk, and he did the hardest, most uncomfortable thing. But after he did that, eternity was bigger, and it included us. 
in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. It says, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's the same mathematical expression today. And you are a part of the equation. Tara and his boys provided for their in-laws because of a death in the family. Jesus' in-laws, or under the laws, were all condemned to death. Every one of us. Abraham was asked to take in a new, new family members and shift it into a ministry that no longer fit his home. Thousands of years before that, Jesus clarified that he, had, was, was, he, he was preparing a place for us. And not just any place, but many mansions. And Abraham did this before Jesus ever even shared that plan. And Abraham committed to this. It was an impossible promise with an outcome that was unknown and unclear. How are you gonna be many nations and you don't have any children, right? But Jesus, Genesis 15 and six tells us, it says he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. God is good as math. You do the math. So, before I come back and pray us out, I would love for you to listen to the, the lyrics of one more song. And when I come back, we will say a prayer and have our benediction. Be still and know that I am God. Great Father, Creator, Lord, we love you. We bless your name, God. We praise your name, God. We let every part of our bodies lean into the goodness of you. God, we thank you for occupying the same space with us, letting your Holy Spirit be inside of us. And Lord, we ask that you just help us to not be seasonal in our obedience. God, help me to do the things that you ask Whenever you ask them, the moment you ask them, without a second thought, Lord, let me not let the physical things I see in front of me be more real to me than you are. God, I ask that you bless this congregation, that you bless our fast, that you reward us with a, a feeling of closeness and a connection. Lord, that you pour your spirit, let it overflow in us and through us as we move through these last couple of the weeks of the Easter season, God, of the, the time when the whole world celebrates that after three days and three nights, you got up. Lord, we thank you for the answer to the problem, the problem of human sin and, and condemnation, the problem of, of sin anywhere, Lord, that, that even with the heartbreak that you must have experienced when Satan recruited a third of your angels away from you, God, that you still moved forward with your plan for mankind, that you still moved forward with us being your family, and you came down here and you walked amongst us so that you could know what you needed to do when you got back to heaven, and so I thank you for that. Lord, help us to remember it in the tough times, but even more so in the good times. I bless this building, this church, God, with your power through your spirit. Thank you for all of these in your son's name. Amen. Let's have a benediction. May the love of the Father, the tenderness of the Son, and the presence of the Spirit gladden your heart and bring peace to your soul this day and all days. Amen. Amen.